coming to that in session. This is Jan. Is this what? Oh, she is going to give a presentation on trusted computing and mobile devices. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome to all from my behalf in this after lunch session. Uh, it is actually the description I, I sent to the conference when I'm aiming uh, to actually by this presentation. And uh, please help me to, to get through all these promises. So if I forget to say something, make a question, and we can fulfill that as well. But the idea really is to, to give a little bit my, my personal views about how trusted computing and, and more like security mobile devices has been developing over the years from my angle and from my behalf, how I've seen it going. And then at the end part of the presentation, I, I try to talk a little bit that how do I see the, the trends pointing the direction maybe for the future, what, what are the kind of main things that uh, I become noticing. It doesn't necessarily say that that's guaranteed future, but it, it talks a little bit that uh, what to follow up and kind of, you know, identify and think that is it really getting to that direction or is that just a minor indication but things are changing to some another. And a little bit discussing about this area is, is more or less my aim. So usually I, I start thinking about what is this security everybody is talking about and, and to have my view for this is the kind of reason for this slide. I really think uh, security, not as a technology, it's uh, alone or itself. It touches the technology, but it's a lot of other things <coughs> come on. And I don't start describing the trust, which has been already described many times, so let's just talk about this security. But the security to me is, is that things are actually working like they should. And, and that's the quality part of the security. And, and then the security part of the security is that they still do, even though the system is somehow becoming unstable, somebody is attacking it or trying to force it to do something else. And, and then the later part is exactly this, that when the system fails, it still doesn't open vulnerabilities for the attacker. And, and that's for this list of descriptions is saying that it's a process of doing things, the way of doing things, not the product itself or anybody else that the security. Uh, software companies, I guess. And, and it's kind of, it's all over the place. So security is not just a feature, it's not just a DBM, but it's actually the software running in device. And then even, let's say, uh, like we know, the sites and attacks. Security is also that how you are avoiding somebody listening to your keys to the RF, for example. And this product security area where I'm mainly concentrating in most of my activities exactly this kind of extra robustness. And, and that's what I, I personally see security is kind of quite simple goal, but of course damn hard to achieve in practice. Because there are a lot of things to do and, and usually systems are so complex that you don't exactly know what should be done or where the vulnerabilities might be. And, and testing something what you don't know is becoming also quite quite challenging. Then talking a little bit more about this security, that uh, what security are you, is something which I, I end up discussing many times as well. Especially that, uh, because sometimes people talk about the uh, like corporate security as a security. Which of course is security itself, but it's, it's not anything what I can actually talk or, or, or let's say express very, pretty, pretty wisely. It's, it's really not my expertise. I think security is many times mixed with this product security, but this is my main area. Uh, I simplify IT security, sorry for those who think differently, but I usually say it's a maintenance security. So you are running somebody else's design systems and, and you configure those to be secure enough for the purposes you have bought them. But the product security is that you actually design systems, you build new scoping principles, you create the architecture which is resistant for the attacks. And of course, the important part I always like to keep in, in my uh, talk is this. There's no security without reactive security. So any system will fail day or another, sooner or later, that's my belief. 
and that for any system must be designed this in mind. That how you are able to patch it, how you are able to shut it down, how you are able to limit the damage for the per minute. Even when you are designing technologies or standards, you should think about how I'm going to react if this is going to be hacked. Am I putting all my eggs in the same basket and just trust that okay, it's strong enough and then learn something new later? Or am I going to do like this morning we discussed about this algorithm agility uh, with the TDM that actually I'm able to change the algorithms on the fly when, when those tend to be not so strong anymore. And, and these all together create this kind of some level of understanding for the security and of course, which is not least, it is exactly this techno technologies and technical security like TPM, for example. This is the main topic in this conference as well. So then, talking a little bit of the nature of the security, how I see it in practice, especially in consumer devices, what I'm mainly doing in, in my profession, this is a diagram which is trying to communicate how the security level is actually changing through the life cycle of the product. And there are a couple of main messages here. The first is that uh, you shouldn't aim in the, in the kind of maximum level. So here is the timeline where the product is, is kind of getting older, and here is the amount of the effort you put in order to keep it secure and design it to be secure as well. This black line is actually uh, showing the, the, say, the exact amount of security effort needed in order to protect that particular product. Usually nobody knows exactly where this goes, but I just have the feeling of, of kind of drawing it up here at this level. And, and the message is that if you put all your guys doing security, all your testing efforts, all your technologies, you can get your security level this high, really high. But actually, in this time of the life cycle of the product, you just need that much. So all this gap is, is something which is not actually needed. Now, if we go over the life cycle, like at this point, the needed amount is, is this much. So how it actually varies over the life cycle of the product is, for example, that how much you are having guys patching, software, how much you are having people of, of uh, let's say, observing what's going out there and, and reacting accordingly, and how much you actually have software developers to, to, to create a new versions of the software in order to remove the vulnerabilities, and, and kind of how active you are of, of keeping the products, and especially the assets you are trying to protect, protected. And now, the main idea here is that that wins who estimates this line the best. So if, if you are just putting all your efforts and, and getting this high, just to be sure, you are wasting all this time, money, and, and effort, then your competitor is actually just putting this much. So they are much cheaper, they are much quicker, and probably also much more simpler products on the market, and they most probably overtake your market because you are still wasting your time and trying to get the perfect security in place. So once you are coming out with your product, and this is the perfect product for the security, it's already three years old and nobody wants it. And, and that's why you have to estimate this line. And this is something which is driving, especially the consumer markets, that all that is so, so high that nobody is having luxury actually to aim much higher than it actually is needed. And of course, if you fail to estimate the line, by aiming too low, you start getting reactive measures in place. You have to have incident response team, you have to send patches out. And the more low you go, then of course more close to those vulnerabilities will become to you. More you need to patch and react, and of course if you are at a zero level, your system probably is not even designed to recover, and, and you probably lose the whole business case. If you are aiming a little bit above, it's proactive security, it's still cost by something like one tenth, one tenth of the reactive size and you can aim a little bit safer side than really any possibility on your kind of goal. Did I make this clear? So 
let's not complicate it. Okay, okay, then one our last message in this slide is that actually it never gets back to zero in most of the products I do. But it's getting really close to zero. If we think 10 years old, mobile phone, its security is not that important anymore than the mobile phone today. But if something really, really bad and high profile is happening with that product, if our brand is still existing, then we still have to respond to that. And that's what I would like to talk about. It actually never disappears back to zero anymore, because if it's really badly misused, we probably have to respond anyway. Yes? This, this model, which I think you explained very well, but it does presume that there are no initial requirements. There are no security requirements that you bring in, right? You're, you're assuming that, that some level of engineering and security engineering being baked in in the development cycle somehow. So that's what the assumption is, so that you come out the door, people don't exactly know your vulnerabilities, whatever, release it to the market. And if I'm understanding correctly what this curve is. Yes, I, I think you hit the right point. And actually the requirements are in there. So okay, so there's so they have the estimation. Okay. So once you think the life cycle of your product, okay, it's gonna have this valuable content I'm having these mechanisms to move it or to store it. Then you have to estimate that, okay, what kind of attacks I'm getting and that turns to be the requirements, which is then aiming for this line. Okay. Thanks. That was a good clarification. Okay, then a little bit of the history. So this is actually the first smartphone I, I uh, was privileged to work with. This is the first project I, I was part of in Nokia. And uh, we actually created this, this well, let's say the communicator product was, was done before me, so I, I was a part of that team. But uh, I created this wonderful card reader device for the communicator in order to enable the electronic cash over the internet. And, and if you now think that, okay, what, what we are talking about, the leading use cases for the smartphones today, that, oh yeah, e payment would be nice, and, and especially internet payments. PayPal is of course sold in some part of those and other little payments are probably still done by credit cards. But some people decided the e-cash as well. So we tested it and, and actually uh, utilized it with our partners already in 1998 and it was kind of public presentation in multiple places. But users were not ready for this kind of thing and of course there wasn't too many things in the internet to really utilize this idea. But security was sufficient already that time, so actually the, the solution did have end-to-end -end security from smart card to another, so it was cryptographically protected end-to-end. -end. I wouldn't say this is kind of unhackable, but at least it was quite difficult to, to break at normal, let's say, by, by knowledge of that time. But that system, uh, smartphone itself, didn't have much more security than the SIM card protecting the subsidy or subscription information of, of the, the phone user. And, and then uh, the system integrity was protected by Nokia proprietary, uh, let's say, security solution inside the phone system. But then we developed it further. Oh, actually, I forgot to say something that uh, yeah, the apps, we were able to download apps already in this. This device and also purchase the ringing tones, which you were also able to, to send to your guys over the infrared, so you know, it, it wasn't really the DRM at the moment. But it was pretty great fun anyway. So then, then we move forward to the next generation, which was then already power display running Symbian OS, and there was already the software signing like the PKI. So now the applications in integrity were protected. They were uh, verified by the digital signature in the device itself. And an application amount, of course, is increasing quite a lot. One uh, particular advanced thing there was that actually there was this online checking possible for also for this application integrity, but we didn't enable it by default because there wasn't really strong demand for that. But that was pretty advanced at that time that we can actually verify application integrity online, if you like. And we also have one of the first 
antivirus software running in this device. So it was pretty full smartphone at that time already. And if we now think that, okay, what was the security demand at that time? I, I claim that this was a little bit ahead of the time. We, we saw first of all hardware coming a couple years later than this, but this was already protecting against those. And now we can think that, okay, with IP, did we aim already too high over this, this estimated line, or was it online exactly? And that's actually, I, I'm still waiting on doing the right thinking that did I waste our company resources doing too much security already that time? But of course, I, I never say that I did because it was a good learning anyway for everybody how to proceed in that kind of area of PKI. Just creating a PKI, you know, it's, it's kind of quite a wonderful project anyway. Then, the biggest uh, reviewal we had then after that talk was that we just put this kind of trusted execution environment inside the device. So it was actually uh, the idea which is now in most of the smartphones today, the untrust zone based trusted execution environments I think are in every smartphone today. We had it there already and, and that actually created us very capable of protecting the firmware, have a secure boot, uh, really kind of uh, look the integrity of the whole system, and, and we were pretty confident at that time that uh, that's, that's the kind of level we need in future, and, and we don't have to aim much higher. And of course, it's, it's quite a long time ago already, and, and I'm happy to say that the system itself wasn't really entirely hacked ever. Even those times when it was popular, because nowadays, of course, you might laugh that uh, nobody uses Syrian anymore, but it was popular sometimes. And even that, it, it took pretty well. So there we had this, this secure execution environment, the, the base kind of actually containing this, this environment, running these uh, trusted applications, protecting the integrity of the device, but also helping in the manufacturing uh, and storing the keys in a secure location. So it was pretty full cool problem and a hardware security device, and of course at the same time it did have the, uh, sorry, the SIM security in place as well. And if you now compare this set to the smartphones we have today, fundamentally there are no big differences. So it was a part of the base chip. So we designed it inside the base chip. So it was no chemical writer also at that time. So we had to define that to every, every supplier and we met separately. That okay, how in this chip is going to happen and how in this chip is going to happen. And now you can probably understand why I was so motivated to DCT already this time. So it would be nice to get some standards in place. Can you put it in the base match chip to get it out the process? Or just put that in any place to do it? That, that felt like a convenient place at the time, so I, I'm not fully aware of, of the, the decision details why exactly we ended up in there. But it was, I think we had separate application processor, at least one of these products at that time, but then we also combined everything together to have it cheaper. And then we jumped to this year. So now we have actually a smartphone with the firmware TPM that is with boot integrity, with TPM is assisting firmware integrity, application integrity. Actually, application integrity is, as you know, it's nowadays uh, verified by the app store itself already and must be installed the digital signature object. There is this product with execution environment there, and, and of course, user data encryption and, and plenty of operating system services. Helping, helping to have this, this kind of end-to-end -end security and security functionality itself in place. Can you have any of the applications in this particular record? At the moment, there's no access for, for that in this, this version of, of, of the devices. But actually, um, one thing to, to ask you, and, and I like it to entertain you a little bit on, on this thinking. So in, in my slides, I had this, this really, really old communicator. And, and quite many years after, somebody told me 
But why did you actually try to sell this thing as a phone because it's the size of a brick? So why didn't you try to sell it as a PDA, which is having phone built in? And uh, yeah, that's a kind of other way of thinking. And, and if you now think this, this device, and you say, oh, we have a mobile phone with filmer TPM. Uh, maybe it's not so much news. But then I, I realized actually in this trip that I have this phone here. And, and then I put it in, in my Fender Control uh, accessory here. Now I actually have digital camera with the TPM in. So should I say that I have a digital camera which is running TPM? Will I get better headlines by this um, thing about? That is, I was glad that I figured it out. Maybe I should say so. Okay, now after all these historical view and the kind of update what, what we have in our digital camera or, or mobile phone, so then, kind of recap, okay, what's the need for this whole security? Based on this curve, of course, I would say that it's an actual need. So the estimation for the line where it goes, that, okay, how bad you are going to be hacked if you are not having it? Or is the assets you are protecting that important you need it? So basically, it is the business case. That how much you put effort, how much you expect to get money back, and what is your estimation for the risk of how much you are losing money if something is getting really, really bad? And then, of course, there is compliance as well. That especially in the privacy field, that you get this kind of uh, ideas how to protect the user's privacy, and it needs a certain level of security to keep the controls in place. And I don't know about you, but personally, I don't like compliance driven security because many times it's just tick box security and it doesn't lead the real security that people put too much effort of thinking what else should I be done or have done they just okay I have done the mandatory parts that's move on so then if we think that the, the smartphone area more in general okay the ecosystem game is, is ongoing in this as well and, and I mean ecosystem game in a way that uh, well, there is kind of security features. Security features always create controls. Like we have learned, okay, somebody is signing the software, somebody is a trusted third party in BKI. And actually these controls, they create politics. They also create competition. Who want to be the central point of taking fee from everybody of signing the software or being a trusted third party? And, and that for this ecosystem, uh, thinking and, and war is, is still all over the place with smartphones and smartphone security as well. And, and we shouldn't underestimate the impact of that while we are designing this kind of open security standards. Not everybody wants to be so open. And therefore, I actually said that big players maybe do not need that much standards because they actually master the whole end-to-end -end ecosystem anyway. So they rule how things are, but they also are capable of recovering everything through their proprietary systems. And the web ecosystem is big enough, it's holding enough users that you are actually able to find that all as well. And at least for me, it looks like it, it's kind of a little bit playing away the, the, the importance of the standards. If, especially these, these uh, big players don't want to see standards contribution for the R&D speed, agility of system design and things like that. And reinventing things is quite popular nowadays still. And then of course, a little bit kind of provocating that the security standard really increase the security overall. So if we think uh, like SIM cards or TPMs, are they then that was ultimate answer for all security. That once you have a TP inside, it's all heaven then. No security worries anymore. And that's a little bit easier because, of course, security standards are really good for they They give much better possibilities for certification, which is not with this compliance driven 
but also it, it gives uh, kind of more transparency that actually people can trust that there's no spooky things or at least stupid things inside the system design because the, it's based on the open standard, the open specification. So it speeds up discussions and, and you don't have to run so many code reviews or audits in order to, to have a kind of a meaningful discussion with your possible customers. Also it streamlines the system design when some of the building blocks are already well defined and verified to be secure enough so you don't have to go it through and, and, and kind of analyze it too deeply when you see that okay the right guys and have been done it. And, and that's what like this we heard on a first day in the same presentation that they are going to publish the, the protection profile for UTM or hardware root of trust. I think it's a very helpful thing that you can actually take any of our hardware solution and compare them. Am I fulfilling all these what they put in this paper? And if you do, it's a good for you. And, and especially when the standard starts referring that yeah, we also verified our standard against this one. So we are in pretty good shape already. Of course, that doesn't give you a guarantee that there are no mistakes. But it helps you to aim for the right things and, and verify the right things already. So standards are bringing a lot of good in, but they probably are not the ultimate solution for the security. And, and one part of the security which I'm really familiar myself is that holding principles, system design, are you actually managing your software security effort is having big impact. So like this, this first product I, I showed to you, which was the first entire set of custom execution environment and stuff. So I was actually trying this project inside Nokia. And then soon I realized that I have all hardware security, I have PKI, application security, uh, I have uh, firmware verification, boot integrity, but still our developers were using coding methods which are not that good, so we had some trouble with software quality. But especially they started to bypass some of the security functionalities because they didn't know about good coding principles, they didn't know what the system security is meant for. And there I realized that, okay, actually, you have to be able to check your way of managing software security engineering as well. PC is one of the examples I'm, I'm really familiar with myself. It's a nice way of checking that I'm doing all the necessary things and the things you don't do, you should use be aware why I'm not doing those. Safeco is giving excellent source of material that how the industry leading software companies are actually doing their software security in practice, coding principles, even supply chain security management. It's all free material there in the internet. Anybody will use and utilize. Office is giving some similar kind of uh, stuff for web applications. And I, I, I think that this is really important part of security as well. If you do all this well, then you will not be that strong part of security anymore. Or well, at least you don't try to overcompensate. The, the bad software security is some part that we doesn't really make the miracle anyway. But both are needed, so don't get me wrong. I, I say that uh, hardware security is something which is usually a relatively cheap investment for the long term, and it's kind of static security for a long time. Then you can back it up with software security engineering principles, which are providing in good design, good threat analysis, good testing, all these practices, you start to have an entire system which is secure. But one doesn't really replace another. Then there is even one more thing, but you're probably already thinking that, ah, but there's one additional contributor from the security which is often kind of screwing up everything. It's a configuration. If you think these commercial products, like firewalls or, or any secure systems. There's a general setup that it, it can be configured to, to fulfill this need or that need or, or those needs. But if it's mis misconfigured or if it's not up to date, it opens the whole system anyway. Like if you heard the presentations in Black Hat or Defcon this year, there was some guy explaining about the, the medical or, or healthcare industry. And their environment, there's compliance and even security. And one of these examples uh, showed that there was a system uh, scanning people's bodies. And, and it was run by PC, which was protected by firewall, in an environment which was protected by firewall, which was protected by firewall against the internet. 
got three firewalls after each other. Because it has been said there must be those. But all the firewalls were just by default configuration because if they touch it, it stops working. So everything was wide open to it. But there were these firewalls. And that's exactly the, the case of misconfiguring or not configuring at all. So that's why even the best hardware security doesn't help you if you don't know how to use it. You are not configuring correctly or your software is somehow done incorrectly or low quality. And there's this international security form, ISF, which is taking lots of care of these configurations and, and uh, IT security. So they have created their role in this pile of security measures as well. But this is pretty much what I had for today. And now I guess we have time for the questions. Setting the lowest possible, and, and the second uh, layer is then that okay, how is your ecosystem made? What, 
what kind of responsibility you are taking on your ecosystem. But there is this uh, one system which is open source, so they are throwing the software in, and then people are utilizing it. If there is trouble, the manufacturer takes the responsibility, and, and that sets the next step. And, and then there are these others which are holding the whole ecosystem in their hands, and they are putting the barrier in the level that they think they are able to tolerate. So what's your what's, what's your path that they Yeah, they should otherwise they cannot really manage for a long time. And, and you have seen actually, if you watch the news, that there has been some learnings on a way that companies have learned that the better authorities are coming to tell okay, you should do better, or then they are just having so bad reputation that they start increasing the security. And in a good case, it actually somewhere the customers are also demanding. Thank you. 